You're walking in the woods. There's no one around and your phone is dead. Out of the corner of your eye you spot him. Hello, my name is Graham and today we're going to be looking at Edge of Darkness, a scenario from the Call of Cthulhu starter set. It is a revamp of a very old classic adventure which is beloved by many and has seen several iterations uh, during its time. The scenario itself is very hit and miss for me. Uh, it is good, uh, however it's got some major problems. I think those nostalgic for it gloss over rather a lot. And it uh, doesn't come close to the haunting in keeper friendliness or hit the beats of uncovering a real story. The plot is handy to you at the start and with uh, little research uh, you can only do so much before you're given dead end after dead end and you have nothing to go on other than to go to the, the final location and to stand um, vigilant against the darkness. There is no light bulb moment for the players and the fact that uh, they're given three variations of the same synopsis uh, right at the start of the scenario by Meather Merryweathers when he gives them the first dark secret uh, which is a monologue uh, and then you get the box which has a cover letter which again tells the players the dark secret and what is really going on and you open up that the box and inside is the journal and yet again you are told now in minute detail about what happened that fateful night as his friend died and one went insane and they summoned the entity from beyond. It's all rather much, uh, having multitudes uh, of pages of handouts to hand the players right at the start, which all say the same thing really in different various ways. Uh, it can be a bit overwhelming and tedious, and I think this is a major problem with the, the scenario. I would cut out the, the, um, the dark secret right at the start, and I would focus on the journal. Yeah, even the, the cover letter really isn't necessary too much. Uh, and uh, you can like whittle it down a bit but even then just the journal is uh, about uh, I think it's five or six pages on the actual scenario uh, which has to be read out or given to the players to read uh, which is really grinds the scenario to, to a stilting halt uh, as this information is expedition dumped right in the players face again and again and again it's obnoxious on top of this, as a keeper, I'm dyslexic. Reading out this amount of dialogue uh, verbatim is a terrible nightmare for me and uh, the players have to sit through me stumbling over words, reading things out wrong and having to go back and correct myself. It's a fucking nightmare. So I, what one of my players was good enough to do was uh, for the prop handout, uh, you will find audio of him uh, reading out these pages for you so you can sit back and let him uh, read it out for you if you wish uh, and I very much wish I had that for the players at the start in my game so it can just be uploaded as an audio file and played for uh, your players on Roll20. From Meriwether's deathbed you are taking on a small investigation which uh, leads you to the Mistonic University Library where you're investigating a, a small sarcophagus shaped box with uh, some odds and uh, sort of inscriptions and writing. Uh, here you can, it's hinted at uh, some of the, the backstory of what is happening, uh, but you're shut down quite hard as uh, you are denied uh, access to uh, the restricted area. This is a, a golden nugget for keepers and uh, players alike. Uh, the ability and um, the authority to say no to players and have your dice rolls fail, even if it's like a critical success, is a, a good lesson to learn, especially early on uh, in your sort of um, Call of Cthulhu sort of uh, play. Because um, a lot of players uh, have um, grown up or sort of assume that uh, if their dice come up green or come up uh, sort of the, the correct uh, success, that they will always get something. And this is a mistake uh, that needs to be corrected. Uh, it tends to be, um, again, D&D players that tend to always want something for a correct dice roll. And it can be a hard lesson for some to learn that this is unaccessible. And uh, with that, uh, a lot of players will um, strive to gain access to the restricted area no matter what. And it will become a, a massive farce. Uh, it can sometimes be focused on so heavily that uh, I, would, I would always have a, a plan in place if your players go that far. Uh, what I did was I had the, the police uh, on call and uh, they would uh, show up uh, to the Mistonic uh, to 
basically take them away. Uh, and uh, you can also use Meriwether's son uh, as a, a sort of a, a bit of a problem here as well. Uh, you can have him linked to the university or you can have him uh, known as they're in trouble. So he can come in and uh, try and uh, get the, the, the deed for the property back off him at his birthright uh, as he would see it. And reintroduce him as a, a complication which can be thrown into the works of any plans they have. Uh, from there, you can go and find information about uh, the cult's leader. Uh, he's been uh, dispatched down in New Orleans. The problem with this one is uh, the information isn't readily uh, available unless they phone down. Uh, what I did was I had uh, some handouts made, so it was like the investigation file had been uh, brought up to uh, Arkham after the, the sort of initial death and had been wrapped up and the investigation was closed. Uh, for the family to, to, to review or to look at uh, at the request of their lawyer. Uh, that way they had handouts to get at the local um, at the local police station rather than having to go down to New Orleans, uh, which some players may uh, inevitably try and do. This will just take your, your, your game off in a massive uh, wild goose chase and try and shut that down hard uh, if it ever comes up. The two pieces of information you get uh, from the uh, New Orleans police are, again, redundant. Uh, they don't really tell you much of what is going on or what is happening. And uh, there are two different perspectives of the same night which tell you exactly the same thing. Uh, this seems to be a running theme with the, the actual scenario. Uh, just the, the, the sort of uh, repetitive nature of what you find. And it's, uh, it's not great investigation at all. The initial investigation doesn't actually give you a whole lot um, of uh, interesting uh, dynamics that will interact with the ritual you need to perform there. There's no um, sort of uh, hidden sort of clue that you can uncover that you can in the haunting where the, the, the dagger can actually wound uh, Mr. Corbett. Uh, here it is basically just backstory. And um, you could pretty much skip all of it uh, and go straight into the, the ritual uh, without even blinking. None of it is relevant at all. And I think this is a, a big problem with the scenario. Uh, where it is enjoyable, uh, it really doesn't shine here at all and it, it's all can just be glossed over. Uh, you could remove every single bit of it and just turn up at the farm to start the ritual with the information given as the, the precursor to the scenario and everything will work just the same. From here, you move into the old farmhouse itself, and this is where the scenario really shines for me. Uh, the mood and tone uh, feel dark, and uh, there's a, a mood shift in the whole scenario as you sort of uh, cautiously move through the, the grounds of this uh, farm in the middle of nowhere that's been abandoned to time. There's a real evil dead vibe going on as they find corpses uh, of animals lying around the, the grounds and even uh, can stumble across one of the locals that's wandered too close to the lurker's lair. The house itself um, is uh, dark and sinister, though there's not much to find there in the ways of interest other than what you would expect, which is the, the ritual items needed to perform the occult uh, task at hand. From here, they will come across Red Jake, a table leg wielding hobo that from all accounts across the internet has killed more than a few investigators in his time. And my session was no exception, critically hitting uh, two PCs and tripping one of them down the stairs to their ultimate demise. The, this uh, hobo that can be found in the house is uh, a, a very uh, uh, solid addition to the actual scenario. Play him up as uh, hard as possible as a uh, a sort of precursor of what could happen to the actual investigators, this madman uh, who's terrified of the, the lurker. The ritual itself is uh, quite easy to perform and the investigators have everything at hand in the house given to them. Uh, they just have to set it up and uh, start uh, the, the preparations and uh, eventually start the ritual itself, needing a, a few rolls to keep chanting and throwing some powder into the, the fireplace as a, a way to um, well, uh, cast out this uh, lurker from another dimension. They are way safer than they think they are with the wards on the house uh, and uh, even the zombies that are raised by the lurker cannot pass the wards. 
Um, I would suggest you do one of two things, or perhaps both. Uh, have the house itself be very fragile and the zombies can actually knock down the walls, including the wards, breaking that seal and allowing them to enter along with the entity. Or have the, no the zombies just ignore the, the wards on the walls completely and allow them free reign to enter the house. The zombies themselves are quite challenging. There's even a zombie bear, uh, which is a terrifying thing indeed to behold. All the while trying to perform this ritual, they have to fend off these zombies and the, the lurker as it spits an acid-like substance at them uh, through the windows and cracks in the ceiling. It is a, a very uh, interesting and uh, tense um, like scene if it's played correctly and you allow them uh, that sort of risk to be involved uh, and it has to be um, sort of played up and uh, escalated uh, as they keep on chanting. Uh, the ritual itself uh, not having any escalations in it, it's just a, a mundane task which has to be repeated over and over. So you have to inject these these elements as the, the main factor to get that the most out of it. When it ultimately came to the end and the chanting was getting to the climax, I had the the lurker itself um, appear in the middle of the, the actual circle and uh, everyone take a sand hit because of the, the sort of appearance of the lurker. It can be revealed also with um, a certain powder that can be thrown as well, uh, but mostly people will be um, trying to uh, do the ritual and deal with the zombies. So this is an ideal p uh, place to showcase the, the, the lurker itself. And I had uh, one of the my investigators suffer the, the same problems that the, the Dark Brotherhood had as one was um, sort of became insane and saw the, the sort of uh, lurker as a, a sort of loved one and moved towards it only to have his neck snapped and uh, killed pretty much instantly. Uh, the overall, the, the climax is very thrilling and it's a, a nice uh, to see a ritual play out in a scenario itself. I just feel it could be handled a little better. Uh, with each uh, successful chant, uh, something else could occur and you have to escalate it. More zombies come, uh, more acid, or they have to change up something in the ritual itself. Uh, Keith Herber is one of my favourite old school authors and it's great to see one of his works revised and uh, shown some love. Uh, so I did do a full Nook package for this uh, scenario, even though I don't feel it's the best in my opinion. Uh, and I still have a lot of mixed feelings about it. So uh, enjoy the, the prop pack and uh, let, let us know your own um, stories about how you dealt with the scenario and how you felt about it in the comments below. Uh, and I'll see you again next time. Thanks for listening.